Where's Zoe? How are you doing? How are you doing? Are you in Australia? Yes, I am. Oh my goodness. Isn't this exciting? How's everything? Yeah. How are they it's doing in Australia? Um, every, like in terms of health, everyone's yeah. really good. Yeah, we're on, okay. lockdown. we're on lockdown, but it's really manageable. Like we can go within more than 500 meters of our house. So uh -huh. I go for long walks every day. Um, and yeah, I don't know so many people in Australia with it. We haven't had that many deaths. Well, Baruch Hashem. So we're doing good. Baruch Hashem. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a private Chavrus in a minute, so I will see what who else is here. <laughs> Yo, it's a little challenging for the people in Israel. It's seven. It's eight thirty in the morning. I mean, I yeah, think. Sure. Uh, who else is in Australia? Ruby. Ruby's Ruby. other. Yeah. Okay, and then there's some people in Israel. We'll see what the story is. Yeah. Um, I'm learning Zoom. Hmm. Now, do you have a Gamora? One of the things I, I have to, I have, we, we have to make a WhatsApp group for the, for, so we can communicate. Do you have a Gamora Shabbat? No. You have I access to, have, what? I can probably try and get one. Yeah, or, or, um, well, you see, I could theoretically, you can, you're on a computer? Yeah. I could theoretically show you one, but but I I'm scared I'll lose you if I share screen. I don't know what to do to show you a a copy of the Gemara. Um, if you have it up on your laptop and you do share screen. Yeah, I don't I'll have it. Screen. You still you still see me? Uh, yeah. Okay. I can't see it. Now, now the question is, well, how do I get it up on my laptop? Um, Safari. Yeah, but how do I how do I get into how do I get into Safari now? I mean, I don't have my I don't have I my I don't have my main screen to get into something. Select the window or application that you want to share: whiteboard, iPhone, Zoom, Cloud. Are you on your phone or are you on your? No, I'm on a computer. So then you should, if you could, if you open like an internet, like Google Chrome or something, that should be an option. But how do I, but how do I get there without losing you? You're not screen sharing right now. I want to so, close this. I want to close this screen so I can get to my desktop, right? Maybe minimize it. What do you want to do? Like, uh, don't exit, oh, here, don't exit, exit full screen. There we go. Oh, okay. Yeah, I want to get to my uh, uh, here we go. I want to get to my desktop so I can show her a, a, a page of Gemara. Zoe, I don't want to lose you. Hang I'm on. I'm going to try something here. And try something. As in, I can get it up on my screen and then I can have it. Hang on. Hang on. Let's see what happens if I do this. Uh, I'm waiting for the Gemara to load here. No, that's not good. I'm in Safari now and trying to get that Gemara. Oh, here we go. So now I have it up on my screen. How do I get it to you? So now share screen. Now share screen. So let's make this. But if I make this small, share screen. No. But I had to share. Oh, I can see it. Oh, now. So now no. go into Google Chrome. Now, uh, now there we. I see. Now we got to go into that document. Okay, I get it. Gosh, this is a, a very good tutorial you're giving me. Thank you, Zoe. And then we're going to start learning Torah in a minute. Should I get a copy? Because I can probably go to our bookstore and try and get a copy. 
Do you see that now? Yes, I can. Oh, isn't this exciting? Yeah, eventually you should get a copy because if, I don't know, if you want to, that's exciting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here we go. Let's go. Um, the, the, in, in the ninth parak of Shabbat, there's a whole long series of Agadadas on Matan Torah. Okay. Um, the first section deals with Parshanut. Uh, basically, um, figuring out when the story happened, the, the chronology of the story, both the chronology of the six or seven days from when Claudius Yisrael got to Har Sinai to when they got the Torah, and the chronology of how we figure out when Shavuot is from Pesach until Shavuot, how do we get 50 days, etc. So that's Parshanut. We'll, we're going to go back to that. I want to start with the conceptual part, which is a whole different, um, a whole different section. So go down about uh, one, two, three, four. Oh, I can put a, I can put a thing there. I thought I underlined this in Safari. I'll tell you the truth, but I guess not. I think you can annotate somehow. Yeah, well, that's what I thought I did, but it disappeared. Okay, we're going to start there. No, that's not good. I don't want that. I don't want that. There is a way to underline. I don't know where the underlining is. I'm not so familiar with All right, Safari. not to worry. Don't worry. Uh, oh, up maybe up here. Oh, maybe uh -oh. the AA button. Yikes. See the A and the Aleph? Maybe. Yeah, that. no, that that um, just changes. Okay, let's go. Uh, do you see where I have the little hand? Yes. So, Darish, here we go. Galila. There was a, a, a long section, there was an argument between Rabbi Yossi and the Chachamim whether Shavuot occurred on the fifth day of uh, the sixth day of Sivan or the seventh day of Sivan. That's, a, that's an argument, that's part of the, the previous section. This is the end of that section. I just want to see it just sort of an introduction. A Galilean, Harish Galilean, the Rabbi Chizda, Brich Rahmana, blessed is God. The Yahiv Orion Tlisoi that gave us a three part Torah. Three part Torah, Torah, Navim, Ketuvim, right? Mm -hmm. La'am Tlitoi to a three part nation, Kohen, Levi, Yisrael. Al Yadei Tlitoi, by virtue of a third. Moshe was the third child, Miriam, Aaron, Moshe was the baby. By the way, I, I this is. On Safari, this is all translated. I, tr I, don't, I didn't figure out how to get the English translation in here. Nevertheless, so we have a three-part Torah, a three-part nation, a third born, on the third day, sorry, on the third day. Now, the third day means, as you know, before Matan Torah, there were Shloshet Yimei Hagbala. There were three days where they had to separate from their wives as a preparation for Matan Torah. So they were given, this is part of the argument between Rabbi Yossi and the Chachamim. This right now we're going, we'll see in a minute, we're, we're learning all of this according to the Rabbanan, according to the Chachamim. They were given the mitzvah of Prisha on Thursday. So they separated Thursday, Friday, and then the Torah was given on Shabbat. So the Torah was given on the third day. All right. And then it says, in the third month, uh, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan. All right, so the, 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 the Gemara quotes all of these threes, and then it says, you see, Keman Kirabanan. And this is a support for the position of the Rabbanan that, according to them, the Torah was given on, everybody agrees the Torah was given on Shabbat, was given on the sixth day of the month, which means the mitzvah of Prisha, and this is all part of the Gemara that we skipped. The mitzvah of Prisha was 
Thursday, Friday, and then Shabbat was the Torah. According to Rabbi Yossi, Moshe added another day. According to Rabbi Yossi, the mitzvah of Prisha was given on Wednesday, and then there was Wednesday, Thursday. Moshe added a, an extra day, and we'll see the Gemara why Moshe did that, but that would disagree with this Gemara. So we have a proof for the Rabbani. Okay? Fine. Yeah, also, that, I think is in the waiting room. I think. What, what? Mayor's in the waiting room. Oh, how do I? Uh oh. Now, how do I get back to that screen to find her? The Zoom, the, the bottom, the far right one. I yeah, think. but I do because I have all this stuff up. Oh, I have to go over here. Maybe, huh? No. Because I, I have all this stuff up, I can't see the thing that controls. Google, Google. Oh. Because I have all this stuff up, I can't see us. Did I lose you? Um, you see your bottom right icon next to the Google Chrome? Bottom. On the bottom, on your bottom bar, maybe that's, press that. That screen. And then meeting controls. Ah, uh, meeting controls. Well, that didn't happen. Press it again. I... No, that's just sign in. To keep this meeting running, please assign a host. No, I think that's me. I'm the host. That. Oh, this is irritating. I really think meeting controls might be it. I don't know why. Yeah, I know. I don't know why. I don't know why I should have to accept anybody altogether. All right. Uh, in the meantime, I lost you also. I'm still here. Well, I'm just going to close that Safari sheet. That's what I'm going to do. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, admit, good. I felt, you know, it's on the top. Uh, it worked. I got it. It's on the top. Okay. I'm Mia's in. Mia's in, and Noah is in, I hope. Noah, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hi. Yeah, you're there? Okay. There's no. Okay, no we're getting there, guys. But I don't see anybody. I don't know why. Why don't I see it? I only see. Why do I only see um, Zoe? Maybe all that. Maybe your computer's just taking let's, a while. Uh, here, let's pull it. Manage participants. Okay, I figured that out. The the, the bar is on the top. I've oh, got that. Ladies, we we started the Gemara and Shabbos. Um, we, um, we're on share screen right now, so I'm going to bring up the Gemara and Shabbos, I hope. There we are. Oh, 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 did you see that? So you saw just like that. You saw that? That was pretty that was impressive. good. That was professional. That was really good. Um, we're, <laughs> we're going to bring up the Gemara and Shabbos. For some reason, I can't see anybody but Zoe. I don't know why, but, but I, I know you're there. I hear you breathing. And we started learning a Gemara. If you can, you guys see that? Can you guys see the Gemara? Hello. They, they gave thumbs up. Uh oh. Unmute, guys. Unmute your computer. I've got background noise. I don't know if I can. What? What? 
there's like things going on around me, so I don't know if I can unmute. Oh, okay. So raise your hand. Can you see the Gemara? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Noah, you can see the Gemara? Yes, I can. Okay, let's go. So we, we learned, Zoe and I are way ahead. I mean, we'll try to catch you up. You guys, I don't know, you're probably going to fail the test at the end because you missed the whole thing. But there's, there's a drusha starting with my, starting with the little, the hand. Darish hahu glila, a Galilean made a drosha, right? Alea de Rav Chizda, concerning what Rav Chizda said. Barich Rachman ad Yaiv Oraitin Tlisoi. Blessed is Hashem who gave a three part Torah, Torah Navim Ketuvim, La'am Tlitoi, to a three part nation, Kohen Levi Israel, Al Yadei Tlitoi, to a third, Moshe Rabbeinu was the third child, Miriam, Aaron, Moshe. Bayom Tlisoi, on the third day, and this are mentioned that <clears throat> the Gemara that we skipped, the Gemara that comes before this, discusses the timing of Matan Torah, the mitzvah of Prisha, they were commanded, men, they were, men were commanded to separate from their wives for three days before Matan Torah, Thursday, Friday, and then the Torah was given on Shabbat, so the Torah was given on the third day. Bayercha Tlisoi, on the third month, uh, Nisan, Er, Sivan. And the Gemara's point of all of this is Keman Kerubonin. This goes like the Rabbonin's explanation of Matan Torah, that the mitzvah of Prisha was given on Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbat. The alternate version, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yossi said the mitzvah of Prisha was given on Wednesday. They separated Wednesday, Thursday, and then Moshe added another day. And we'll get to that Gemara, why Moshe added another day. And the argument between the Chachamim and Rabbi Yossi is, according to the Chachamim, the Torah was given on the sixth day of Sivan, and according to Rabbi Yossi, the Torah was given on the seventh day of Sivan. And that's a long discussion that we will go back to in the Gemara, okay? The question is, what's so wonderful about all these threes? So the Torah has three parts. That's very nice. And Am Yisrael has three parts. It's also very nice. It's a nice thing. I mean, Kohen, Levi Yisrael. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was a third born. So is, is this just, you know, a total coincidence? It just so happens? What exactly is... Now, in terms of the Gemara, the Gemara quotes this to prove a point. The Gemara is talking about whether Matan Torah was on the sixth day of the month or the seventh day of the month. And this seems to indicate that it was on the sixth day of the month. That's fine. But looking at this in and of itself, not in the context of the argument between Rabbi Yossi and the Chachamim, who cares that there's three parts of the Torah? And if there were four or five or six, and if Moshe was the fourth or fifth child, and if there were, besides Kohen Levi Yisrael, there were a few other sections, I mean, what, what exactly is so significant? <laughs> so, so the Mephorshim discuss it, and, and one of the ideas, one of the ideas is the following, that the, the, the concept of three, right? Three is like, first of all, three is a, a plane, right? Three is always steady. Al shlosha devari ma'olam omeid. Two points is a line, three points is a plane, four points is a shaky table. Uh, we all know that, the, you know, a, a table with four legs doesn't always stand exactly evenly. Whereas three points makes a plane. So three points is, the concept of three is a, a concept of stability, that's one thing, but it's more than that. Um, um, it, three is also, um, like for example, it says, mm-hmm. if there are two psukim in the Torah, one of the, one of the midot that the Torah is, is um, one of the 13 midot by which the Torah is explained, right? The draw, the, the medrash, the, the brice of Rabbi Shmuel, we say right before Borok Sha'amar in morning davening. Um, uh, two psukim that contradict each other. Shnei psukim, Machim says, Ad sheyavo wa katuva shlishi. Until the third pasuk comes, U machria benehem. And machria determines, determines, now, it doesn't say machria ke'echad mehem. It decides which one's right. Machria benehem. It integrates the two. It solves the problem. That's the concept of a three. A three is a, 
a middle that unifies all of the parts. Two is a distinction. Two is dichotomy, dichotomy. Three, the concept of three is that it unifies parts and makes a whole. So that, for example, um, this would be the idea that, that the Torah is a, 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 a unity. It's one. Even though there are all sorts of different ideas in Shivim Panim Latara, there's all different explanations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But ultimately, there's one Torah. And and similarly, Am Yisrael, there's Kohen, Levi Yisrael, there's all sorts of different types in La Am Yisrael, different types of people. But in the end, there's a unity. They're all connected. There's all they're all one. Uh, and 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 so on. And similarly with Moshe Rabbeinu is it, there's mm -hmm. a, is it a family months? So. So um, this is uh, one idea. The second idea, the Maral, is, the Maral has an interesting idea that he talks about in the Maharal wrote a, a commentary on Agadada, and he also wrote books where he organizes Agadada. We'll talk about the Maral later. Um, the Maral has an interesting idea that the concept of a middle is a, a totally abstract concept. Meaning, if you think about it, if you take a line, where is the middle of the line? Well, you'll pick a point, but you could divide that point in half. So you'll take that point and divide it, but each of those, you could divide them in half. And infinitely, you could just keep dividing it in half. That's the morale says that the concept of a middle is something that's beyond space. He talks about why... Why Makot Bacharot was Be'em Satalayla? Why was it in the middle of the night? Because the exact middle of the night, like Rashi says, why did Moshe say Kichat Satalayla? To Paro, he said, around the middle of the night, approximately midnight, because a person can't precisely determine the exact middle of the night. Whereas when Hashem said to Moshe, Makot Bacharot will be Afchat Satalayla, at, at midnight, Moshe said Kichat Satalayla, so there shouldn't be any mistakes. But the Maral says the idea, why the idea of Dav Kechatzot? Because the middle is beyond time. Just like in space, there's no real middle. It's a concept. Similarly, in time, Makot Bechorot is, so to speak, out of time. It's a pr precise middle which can't be ultimately figured. Only a Kaddish Baruch who can make that sort of determination. So the concept of a three is there's two ends in a middle meaning something that is beyond space and beyond time. And according to the morale, the emphasis of this Agadada is that the Torah, Am Yisrael, ultimately they're beyond space and time, they're eternal. That the Torah is eternal, Am Yisrael are eternal, and that's, that's the concept of a three. Okay, so that's, that's sort of an introductory, that's an introductory Agadada. And that's the, and that's the way we're going to deal with Agadada. What happened there? <laughs> Did you just disappear? Oh my god. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Just wait for him to come back. So how is everyone? I guess. Guys, I don't know how we got from three to eternal. <laughs> I, was like, yeah, I, yeah. I think I missed the link as well. Do we because do three has a middle and a middle is eternal. <laughs> yeah, so he, how long was it just you and him? A good ten minutes. A good <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> it's so fun. Can each other like, are you in? Oh my god. Shame, I'm so sorry. That's so fun. What is going on in someone's background? Yours? Me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Someone's freaking doing construction work. It's what? so annoying. It's so, so annoying. annoying. I don't know. I thought everyone's oh, meant to be locked thing? down, but apparently not. Hmm. Apparently you can still wake people up with construction. Yes. Oh, that's construction. It's not my thing. Okay, no, 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 it's, it's, right. it's someone like her. I just put on headphones. I really hope he knows the way on. Hello, ladies. I, I think oh. I lost you for a minute. 
<laughs> yeah. I, lost, I don't know what happened. Lost everybody for a minute. Okay. Uh, welcome back. I'm going to try to put the um, to put that um, Gamora back on the screen. Okay. You got it? Okay, got it. good. Mm -hmm. All right, let's try again. <laughs> so that that's the that now before we start the next Gemara, a very quick introduction. I don't know if you went to I don't know if you were in in um in Rabbi Blouse, I got it this year, but very quick introduction. Rambam. The Rambam says there are three attitudes to Agadada, right? One is that they're all silly. They're kind of silly stories. And, um, you know, they're just Chazal kind of making up stories. So that's the Rambam says that's clearly wrong. The second he says is people take them absolutely literally. They mean exactly what they say. They're to be taken literally. And the Rambam says that's also clearly wrong. I don't want to go into the whole Rambam. And the third position the Rambam says is that they, they're, 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 they're metaphors, they're stories that Chazal use to teach ideas. They're not to be taken literally, but they're te it's, this is the way Chazal discussed theology, philosophy. They didn't write books of philosophy. They didn't write books of theology. They discussed it in Agadada. So the trick to Agadada is to decipher the story. What exactly are Chazal trying to teach us? Now, um, there's, there's, always a, there's always a hook to it, meaning they don't just make things up. So for example, the next Agada that we're going to learn. When Am Yisrael, the story of Matan Torah, Shmot Yud Tet, Am Yisrael leave the camp, and it says they went out to greet Hashem, and they stood Tahar under Mount under Har Sinai. Now the the drosh is going to be based on a on a on a on a, on a problem in the pasuk. It says Tahar, the under part. It, why didn't just say Tahar? They stood under the mountain. They stood. Really, it should say they stood at the foot of the mountain. But it says they stood under the mountain. And even when it says under the mountain, it doesn't say tachat, it says tachti tahar. So, Amar Rav Avdini Barchama, Barchasa, Rav Dimi Barchama, Barchasa, Malamed, this teaches us, famous Gemara, Shekafa HaKadosh Baruch Hu Aleihem, God lifted up and covered them at the har, the mountain, Kigigit, like a barrel. God held the mountain over them like a barrel. God held the mountain over. Now, it doesn't say, I mean, there, there's another, there's a problem. I mean, it doesn't say held the mountain over them. It held them over like a barrel. I mean, like, what's a barrel? A barrel is a big, um, you know, uh, well, barrel, but it's hollow inside. So this also is from the word takhtit, meaning they're not under the mountain, they're under something, they're under mountain, but there's sort of something hollowed into the mountain that the mountain looks like a barrel. It looks like something with a hollow part underneath it. But why exactly we have to say that? That's interesting, we'll see. Ba'amar lahem, and then Hashem says to them, imatem mekabli matara, if you accept the Torah, mutav, very good, everything will be fine. Vim lav, and if not, sham tehe kavuratam. I'm going to bury you here. This will be your burial place. Meaning, I'm going to drop the mountain on you and kill you all. You know, simply. <laughs> That's like a simple explanation. So, so again, um, the morale points out, it, 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 God didn't literally lift the mountain over their heads. The question is, what, what are Chazal trying to teach? What are they saying? What's the point? Now, the fact that it says, Tachtit, so that's the beginning of the drasha. It doesn't say under the mountain, which, by the way, if it said under the mountain, we would have got the same idea. They're held under the mountain. God said, I'm going to bury you in the mountain. The fact that it says tachtit, well, that means the mountain was, had, an, had an under part. It, had a, it was like a gigit. It was like a barrel. Okay. And what's different about that? Why couldn't God just hold the whole mountain over their head? Why did the mountain have to be, you know, with sort of some kind of, part dug out of it. That's sort of a, an interesting problem. 
And then, of course, the metaphor of the grave is very good because if they don't accept the Torah, then it's not that the flat bottom of the mountain will crush them. The, the mountain will come down on top of them and they'll be in something that looks like a grave surrounded on all sides by the mountain. So it's that, that's sort of the, the image of the grave. Okay. Nevertheless, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a difficult it's a difficult idea because um, what does it mean that we were forced to accept the Torah? And so the Gemara goes on, Gemara goes on and says, Amar of Acha Bar Yaakov, Rav Acha Bar Yaakov said, Mikan, from here, Moda'a Rabbah, I have a terrific claim, a large claim, Lerisa, against, on the Torah. I can claim that I'm exempt from Torah. Because I never agreed to do it. I never agreed to keep the Torah. I, I was forced. God held the mountain over me like a, like a mountain. So I'm, I'm out. I have a, a perfect reason not to keep the Torah. Amar Rava. Rava finishes the story. says, you're right. Afalpike, nevertheless, hader v'kiblu abiyameach But Klal Yisrael later re accepted the Torah in the days of Achishverosh, like it says, Kimu v'kiblu yehudim. That when Achishverosh and Esther, uh, sorry, when Mordechai and Esther um, uh, declared this new holiday of Purim, Klal Yisrael accepted the holiday. But it doesn't say, it says, Kimu v'kiblu. It doesn't say they accepted it and they did it, which is, which one should say, they accepted the new holiday and they kept it. It should say, Kiblu and Kimu. But it says first Kimu of a Kibu. First they kept it and then they accepted it. So what's the drasha? Amarava, right? What does it mean? Kimu Masha Kiblu Kfar. They re accept, reestablished, reaffirmed is a better word, reaffirmed what they had already accepted. All right, meaning they reaffirmed their acceptance of Torah. So that's that's the story. So again, Kaddish Baruch Hu holds the mountain over them like a like a, uh, a barrel. They're forced to accept the Torah. If we're only forced to accept the Torah, we should be able to say, well, you know, I, I didn't agree to Torah. I just had to do it. So I have a reason to say I'm not going to keep the Torah. And Rava says, no, but we, we re-accepted the Torah later in the time of Purim. That's the story. Now, let's just go back and think about this for a minute. When did this happen? If you remember the story of Matan Torah, I mean, if not, you have to go back and look at Sefer, at, at Sefer Shmot, Perak Yotet. Maybe we should do that at some point, right? What happens? I mean, before Am Yisrael accept the Torah, they say, Nasev right? I mean, we think. They say Nasev So they already accepted the Torah. So why does God have to hold the mountain over their head? Now, this, this gets us into a, that, so that, that's a problem. I mean, if we already said Nasib and Ishma, so we accepted the Torah already. So, so what's the point of holding the mountain over our head? Now, that in and of itself gets us into a problem. Um, if you, hopefully, I don't know, I'm sure Rabbi Liebtag talked about this, or I don't know if you did it in Chumash, but you know, there's two stories of Matan Torah in the Torah. There's Perak Yud Tet in Shmot. And then at the end of Parshish Mishpatim, the Torah goes back and talks about Matan Torah again. Now, according to Rashi's explanation, the stories that are told in Perak Kaf Dalid in Shmot happened before the Aserah to Dibrot. Remember, in Perak Yud Tet in Shmot, there's the story of preparing for Matan Torah. Perak Kaf is the Aserah to Dibrot. Then comes all of Parshat Mishpatim. And at the end of Parshat Mishpatim, there's again 12 psukim to talk about Matan Torah. Rashi says those 12 psukim belong really back in Perak Yud Tet. Now it's in those 12 psukim that it says Nasev and Nishma. So according to Rashi, Nasev and Nishma came before the Aserah to Dibrot. And there we have a problem. Because if we already said Nasev and Nishma, then why does God have to hold the mountain over our heads and, and so to speak, force us to, to accept the Torah? 
Now, of course, there's another way to look at the Torah. That's the Ramban. The Ramban says the Torah is in order, and the story that's told at the end of Parshat Mishpatim, Perak Kaf Dalid, right, happened after the Aserat Dibrot. In which case, we said Nasev and Nishma after the Aserat Dibrot. Whoa, that's interesting. So then, this holding the mountain over our head, we have to, well, let's, we can look at it very differently. The, the, the problem disappeared. Um, it sounds like we hadn't yet said Nasev and Nishma. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that view also. So there's a, there's a fundamental question. Does this story of holding the mountain over our head happen before or after we, ex we sort of speak, it said, Nasev and Nishma, we accept the Torah. When did it happen? That's number one. Number two, let's just look at it simply. What, what does it mean? What is it? What, what are, on, a, on the simplest level, what are Chazal saying? What are they saying? Um, really, are, or let's put it this way. What, is, what does this say about Bechira Chavshit? What does it say about our choice to accept the Torah? We were compelled. We didn't really have a choice. I mean, you call it a choice, die or accept the Torah. This, this is not really a choice. Meaning, if you think about it, if you, if you imagine the situation of Matan Torah, we're standing by Har Sinai. There's clouds, there's thunder and lightning. There's this, so to speak, Kol Hashem, this incredible booming voice Right? I mean, we say, Kol Hashem Shover Arazim. It's, it's so incredibly powerful that it's mow mowing down trees. That's what we say on Shabbos, right? Kol Hashem Ba'koach, Kol Hashem. I mean, it's a powerful voice. So, our Bechir Chavshit, to some degree, is based on the fact that we're not aware that we're standing in the direct presence of Hashem. So, we said, well, I'll, you know, I'll daven, I won't daven. I'll say a bracha, I won't say a bracha. I'll, you know, I'll do the mitzvah, I won't do the mitzvah. We, we, we have a choice. But if I can imagine that God descended in a fire in the middle of the room, and I was in the direct presence of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, I don't think I'd be able to say no. If God says, you know, here's the mitzvah, how could you possibly say no? So on one level, this whole Agadada is 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 a way of, of explaining what's, what was the spiritual situation of the Jews at Harsina. Was it possible for them to say no? We I mean, think about it. How, how could anybody, how could anybody say, no, Hashem, I don't want the Torah. Now, you know, there's a famous Gemara in Avot Zorah that, that the non-Jews say to Hashem, you know, how come, you know, you, you know that famous Medrash that they said, that they, God, Kodesh Baruch went to the non-Jews. They said, you want, he says, do you want the Torah? They said, what's written in the Torah? Lo tirzach, you can't murder. Oh, no, 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 we, we make our living by murdering. We don't want the Torah. So, so meaning, and then, they, then he goes, lo tigno of the Torah, he says, you shouldn't steal. He said, no, no, we don't, we don't want to accept that mitzvah meaning. But, but all of those, all of, that's an idea that the nations didn't accept the Torah based on, what was written in it. And that's significant. And Am Yisrael said, Nasev and Nishma, we'll take it and we'll find out later what's written in it. That's true. But there's something else. And this is something that the Garden of Odazar discusses. God also didn't hold the mountain over their head. Or putting it differently, God didn't appear to them with such clarity and such power that they basically had no choice. They basically had no choice. Now, if you say God appeared to us with this clarity and power because we already said Nasev and Nishma, so I understand why God did not appear with that clarity and power to the non-Jews. They didn't say Nasev and Nishma. Okay, but then you're back to your old question. But so if we already said Nasev and Nishma, then why, why should God take away our free choice at a later stage? Why take it away? We, we, freely, we freely agreed to keep Torah, Nasev and Nishma. So then, why this incredibly powerful experience, which essentially robs you of your free choice? And, and that's exactly, by the way, that's what, that's what um, 
That's what Rava Ach, Rav Acha Bar, uh, Bar Yaakov says. Well, we, Moda Rava, we didn't have free choice, so, so it's not fair. We were forced to accept the Torah. I was going to say, look at the Tosfos, but you don't have it. If you can get a Gemara Shabbos for next time, it'd be helpful. But anyway, the Tosfos in the Gemara says like this. Even though they already said Nasev and Nishma, why did God have to hold the mountain? Because maybe they changed their mind. When they see the mighty fire, that their souls left. Meaning, we're going to see in Agadada later that says that after each of the Aserita Dibrot, Am Yisrael basically died. <laughs> the revelation of God was so great that their Neshama left. And then Hashem had to do Tchiat Ametim for them to get the next of the Aserita Dibrot. And after the next one, the revelation was so great, they died again. And this went on a few times. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that Gemara, exactly what the Gemara is trying to explain by saying they died between each of the Aserita Dibrot. Nevertheless, Tosus says, that's the problem. Maybe they said Nasev and Nishma, but the experience of Matan Torah itself, we said it robs a person of their Bechira. Tosa says maybe it's so awe inspiring, it's so frightening, it's terrifying that they would say, well, Nasev, we, we say Nasev will do it, but we didn't understand that it implies this. We didn't understand that it means we're going to die. We didn't understand this level of terror. And, and they would back out. Maybe they would back out. So, so, um, so Tosa says that's why they needed Kofalem Harkagigis. They had to hold the mountain over them to understand, no, guys, you don't understand. There's no backing out. If you back out, you're going to die. Now, that's not really less terrifying, actually. But at least when they heard the Aserit de Dibrot, so to speak, they died, but they came back. And I guess the threat here is, well, but you're going to die, you're not going to come back, meaning you're going to cease to exist. You're going to lose the rationale for your existence. What does it mean that you're going to die? The rationale for the existence of Klal Yisrael is, is Torah. That's what we're here for. So if you don't accept the Torah, then Hashem says, so to speak, what do I need you for? That's one approach. The Maharalmi Prague has a very interesting, he has, he has a really a radical, it's a fascinating approach, radical idea. He says, um, Hashem held the mountain over their heads that nobody should think that Klal Yisrael accepted the Torah on their own. Meaning, Yudavka should not think that we accepted it based on our own Bechira. That's the moral, it's a radical idea. We would say, no, if you accept it on your own Bechira, that's better, right? The Maral says, no. No. Why? From a philosophical point of view, the Maral says, listen, Torah is crucial to the existence of the world. The, the rationale for the creation of the world is Torah. From a philosophical point of view, the world can't exist without Torah. So it's impossible for Am Yisrael not to accept the Torah. It can't be. That, such a thing is basically... You can't say that the entire existence of the world is based on the choice of Am Yisrael. If a Kaddish Baruch Hu wants a world, he wants a world. There's a reason for it. And, and now we're going to see later on, this morale is a radical idea. Later on, the Gemara is going to say things that tend to, tend to, to contradict this. Nevertheless, how can you say that the existence and the perfection of the world is dependent on Am Yisrael? The existence of the world is dependent on Hashem. Hashem agreed there should be a world. Who are we to, to undermine that, that, that Ratzon Hashem? So if you would say that it's possible that we would not accept the Torah, that means, in theory, we could undermine the entire Ratzon Hashem, that there should be a world altogether. Now, you know, there are... There are we, we could argue about that. We could say, no, you know... We could argue and say, in fact, no. Uh, Kaddish Baruch who created the world, and we're going to see a Gemara in a minute that says, it's true, if Am Yisrael had not accepted the, word, the Torah, Hashem would have ended the creation. It's true. But the Maral says, philosophically, that's a problem. 
how, how could you imagine that Hashem creates a world that's not perfect, that's dependent on something outside of Hashem, beyond Hashem? So he says there has to be coercion. Now, then he goes one step farther, and he says an amazing thing. If we're coerced to accept the Torah, and that's necessary, he says, you can't say the Torah, which is responsible for the continued creation of the world, is dependent on us. We're coerced to accept the Torah. That means the whole metaphor of Matan Torah, which is a metaphor of marriage, right? That Kodesh Baruch Hu is the Chatan, and Am Yisrael are the Kala. And in fact, Rashi quotes the idea that the God comes to Har Sinai before we do. The Chatan goes to the Chuppah before the Kala. We're the Kala. And what's the Chuppah? In this metaphor, what, what functions as the Chuppah over the Chatan and Kala? That's the mountain. The mountain is like the Chuppah. So if one of the metaphors for Matan Torah is a Chuppah, so, <laughs> so the Maral says an amazing thing. He says, well, wait a minute. If a Kaddish Bar who holds the mountain over our heads, we're the Kala. And he says, you have to marry me or you're going to die. He says, isn't that an onus? Isn't that like a rape? God raped us. He didn't give us any choice. He forced us into this relationship. He forced us into the relationship. That's the metaphor of an onus. What does the Torah say about rape? There's an interesting halach in the Torah. The Torah says, Lo yochol kol yamav, a man who rapes a woman is obligated to marry her if she chooses. She can say, I don't want to have anything to do with him. But, and he can never, lo yocha l'shalcha mito, she, he's never allowed to send her away. He's never allowed to divorce her. Meaning, if, if the, if the Maral says, if the metaphor for this um, um, encounter, the metaphor is like a rape. I'm used to all are forced into a relationship with God, and it has to be that way. But that means a Kaddish Baruch who, so to speak, is stuck with us. He can't divorce us. The, 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 the experience of being forced to accept the Torah from our side means one thing. From Hashem's side, it also has meaning. That a Kaddish Baruch who can never, can never, so to speak, divorce Am Yisrael. That our relationship is eternal. So, Wait, so I have a question. Yeah. So like, if, if a woman is raped, like the, the rapist is like required to marry her if she wants. She doesn't have to be tied to him, but he has to be tied to her. Yeah. So if like Am Yisrael is like raped by God, like could we still theoretically say no to the marriage? And that, well, that's it, and that's exactly what Rav Acha Bar Yaakov says. Rav Yaakov Bar Yaakov says, Mikan Moda'a Rabalia Raita. From here I have a huge claim on the Torah. I was forced. If I was forced, I should be able to walk away. That's exactly what he says. Right? If, if we didn't enter the relationship on, based on Bechir, even, even either with the marriage metaphor, without the, even without the marriage metaphor, if, if we were forced into the relationship with Hashem, so we say, well, wait a minute, God, you forced us. We, that's not fair. We, we don't want, we're going to walk away. Okay? So, so that's, I think that's a, it's a, it, that's a rather, <laughs> it's a radical idea. It's a radical idea, but it's, it's fascinating that, that the concept of Har Kagigis, the same way it forces us, it also forces Hashem. There's another, there's another approach. That, that was the approach of the Maharal. Maharal mi Prague, right? You know the Maharal. There's, there's another Maharal, again, very quickly, the Maharal wrote, what's it? The Maharal tried to systematize Agadada, the same way that we say the Rambam organized and systematized halakha in the Mishnah Torah, the Maral said, I'm going to try to organize and systematize Agadada. So, for example, he says, I'm going to write a book that has all of the Agadadas that deal with Matan Torah in one place. We're learning the Gemara and Shabbat. Now, Gemara and Shabbat might not have been the first place you would have expected to find a discussion of Matan Torah. But on the other, where would you find it? So I already mentioned there's a Gemara of Zara that talks very important about Matan. Discussions of Matan Torah spread throughout Shas. So the Maral said, I'm going to gather them all together in one place, organize them, somehow try to organize them, 
And and right and and the second thing the Maral said is I'm going to try to systematize it. I'm going to see if there's an underlying theme to all of the Chazals. If I can see how all the Chazal, the Medrash, the Gemaras, there's an underlying theme that unifies Chazal's approach to Matan Torah. So that's what the Maral did, and that's fascinating. Um, I would just say that that. Any, any systematic thinker, anytime you try to deal with things in a totally systematic way, there are tremendous advantages and certain disadvantages. The advantages are because you have a certain way of looking at things, sometimes you have insights into a Gemara that are really remarkable. And some of the things the Maral says are just amazing because he's coming from a certain perspective that allows him to, to understand the Gemara in a new and different way. On the other hand, Sometimes the Gemaras don't exactly fit into your system and you have to fetch a little bit. And I don't think it's, you know, disrespectful to the morale to say some of the explanations, like he's got to sort of push a little bit or squeeze a little bit to make it fit into his system. Okay? Nevertheless, that's, that's the morale's understanding of this Gemara. And as I said, I think it's a radical idea that Kofalem Harkagigi, the fact that a country bar who forces us to accept the Torah, it's it's, it's still after Nasev and Ishma, but Nasev and Ishma is not good enough. Our free acceptance of the Torah is not good enough. There has to be, the Torah also has to be something that's absolute beyond huma, human beings. It's absolute and eternal. And, and therefore it has to be forced on us, but at the same time, that, so to speak, binds a Kodesh Baruch to his relationship with Am Yisrael. Okay. Now, um, another approach, the approach of the Ben Yehoyada. Ben Yehoyada is another very important commentary on Agadada. The Ben Yehoyada is the Ben Ishchai. The Ben Ishchai was a very, very important uh, Sephardic Akron. He lived in Baghdad, late, ninth, late, late uh, 19th century. Um, just a, a, a huge Tamakach, you know, looks uh, in a, in a, the, we don't have any of our Svartim here. In a, in a traditional Svartic home, you know, there's like a whole bookshelf of Ben Ishchai. He wrote on Halacha, he wrote on Agada, the tremendous Tamar Chochem. All right? So, um, the Ben Ishchai's approach is the following. When, when again, Kofalem Harkagigis came after Nasev and Ishma, but he has a whole new pshat in Nasev and Ishma. When, when Klal Yisrael said Nasev and Ishma, what they said is, Naaseh, we will do the Torah, Nishma, the way it sounds. Meaning, he says, they accepted Torah Shebikhtav. They didn't accept Torah Shebalpeh. They accepted Torah Shebikhtav. He said, look, you're giving us the Torah. What the, whatever the Torah says, we'll do. Naaseh. Nishma, what it sounds like. Whatever the Torah says to do, we'll do. But they weren't ready to accept Torah Shabbat Peh because Torah Shabbat Peh is infinite. Torah Shabbat Peh is the way we normally think of Nasev and Nishma. You have no idea what's going to happen. You can't imagine what could come out. They said, well, we're not ready for that yet. So the, 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 the Ben Yehoyada says that Nasev and Nishma, uh, sorry, uh, Kofalem Harkagigis, was to get them to accept Torah Shabal Peh. Torah Shabichtav was fine, but Torah Shabal Peh, they had to, so to speak, be forced to accept. And then he says, he says a fascinating thing. He says, that's why it says, Kagigis, that a Kodesh Baruch who hollowed out part of the mountain. Meaning, remember we said, if a Kaddish Baruch wanted to force them to accept the Torah, hold the mountain over their head and the mountain will crush them. Why does the inside of the mountain have to be hollow? The idea was, he said, that a Kaddish Baruch was telling him, listen, there's a whole Torah, but there's a whole hollow part in there that has to be filled up. There's more and more and more and more Torah to fill up that hollow part, so to speak. That's Torah Shabal Peh. There's an endless amount of more Torah to be learned, explained, discussed, that fills up, as it were, the, the hole in the mountain. And every word, every bit of Torah we learn adds to that, to that, pre, to that Torah that is already, that's already there. And so, and so that's the concept 
That's the concept of har kagigis. It's, it's a barrel. There is a har, there's a mountain, there's a structure, there's tor shebikhtav. But into that structure, there's an endless amount of new Torah that we can put, that we learn, that's included. That, he says, they weren't quite ready to accept. That For that, you needed kofalem har kagigit. All right? That's the ben yoyad. One more. One more. What if, um, what if this was before Nasev and Nishma? Okay. Now again, we've so far learned that Kofalem Harkagigis came after Nasev and Nishma. That's sort of following Rashi's parshanut of the story. That the end of Sefer Mishpatim comes, a um, uh, Parshas Mishpatim comes in the middle of Parsha Yitro. But for example, according to the Ramban. Kofalem Harkagigis was before Nasev and Ishma. So then you could say that that Adarabah, what, what motivated them, what, what inspired them to say Nasev and Ishma was Kofalem Harkagigi. That having had that experience, then they were ready to say Nasev and Ishma. Um, before that, well, they weren't sure. They said not in 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 Parsha in in Parsha Yitro. They say Kol Asher Diber Shem Naaseh. We'll do everything God says. Now, if you think about it, the whole the whole idea of Matan Torah, which we just sort of take, yeah, well, it's a given. They just came out of Egypt. They just came out of Egypt. Um, Chazal say in Egypt they were on a very low level, Mem Tet Shari Tuma, the lowest level of impurity. We know that all of, we read in the Haggadah that Ilu if God hadn't taken us out, we never would have got out. 50 days later, these people who had spent their lives in slavery in a totally immoral society, right? All of a sudden they're ready for the greatest divine revelation in history. All of a sudden they're ready to become Am Hashem, to accept upon themselves the entire responsibility of, of bringing a Kaddish Baruch, being an Or Lagayim, bringing the, the Ratzin Hashem, the, the, the word, the Divrei Hashem, Ratzin, into the world, the will of Hashem, the words of Hashem into the world. They're ready for that responsibility. Boom, like that, 50 days. 50 days is not very long. Um, you know, soon we will have been locked up in our homes for 50 days. You know, it's like not the most pleasant thing, but would you say, well, I completely and totally changed my entire personality. I'm a totally different person. 50 days is not very long. So where did this ability to express this total dedication, Nasev and Nishma, to express total and complete dedication to God, where did it come from? How did it develop in such a short time? So the answer is, it was a gift. It, it, the Kaddish Baruch held the mountain over our head. Meaning, to some degree, it wasn't just our own personal growth. It wasn't just our individual process of growth. Uh, Kaddish Baruch Hu sort of dumped it on us. He said, listen, ready or not, you guys are going to do it. Ready or not, you're going to get the Torah. Ready or not, you're going to have this amazing experience of a revelation of God. And, and that gave us the ability to say Nasev and Nishma, because of this tremendous revelation. Then the Gemara says, Mikan hod moda raba. but from here there's a tremendous claim against the Torah. What happens when we don't have the revelation anymore? Who says we're going to be able to keep maintaining the Torah when the revelation ends? Kodesh Baruch says, I'm giving you the revelation. That's the, that's the metaphor of holding the mountain over our heads. You're going to have an incredible revelation of God. And, and that's going to give you the ability to totally accept the Torah, Nasev and Ishma. But then we have the problem. What's going to happen when the revelation ends? Are we going to be able to maintain that same level of commitment and dedication? And that's why Rav Acha Bar Yaakov says, Mikan Model Rabali Araita. Fine, we accepted the Torah at the time of revelation. But, you know, we're, we don't always have a revelation of God. How, are, how can you be sure that I should continue to keep the Torah. And that's the story we'll come to next time. That's the completion of the story, the story of Purim. That even when God is not revealed, we were able to maintain and keep the Torah. 
Okay. All right. Ladies, um, we'll get it. If, if you can get it, if you can get a Gemara for next time, that would be helpful. Um, I, I, I see, I, I, I'm learning how to do this, but we wasted. <laughs> so it was very helpful. She uh, it was very helpful. But but I still it's still a little easier if you actually have a Gemara in front of you, I think. But we're we're gonna continue on yeah. on pay what what? Oh, because like like so I mean my friend that I'm staying with has like all of art scrolls, so she has like Shabbat in like a few volumes. There you go. So are pay we gonna go ahead and time? Yeah, we're 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 going straight through Pechet Ahmed Aleph in, in in Gemara Shabbat. Okay. We might go back okay. to, Pe at some point we'll go back to Pei Zion, but we're going straight through Pei Chet Amad Aleph Amad Bet. Okay. So it should all be in the same volume. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know which one, but it'll be probably art school. Probably the, they usually get about 30, 40 well, pages. Like, it'll, like, it'll be predictable. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, Ladies, you. enjoy, enjoy. I hope it stay well. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little vort I heard, and then we'll stop. Um, the Rogachev Rebbe. The Rogachev was a famous, a very famous rabbi in uh, Poland. A, an incredible genius, an incredible, famous, incredible genius. Anyway, apparently, when he would cross the street, he was very careful. Now, it's not like you know there were Ferraris going up and down the streets in Dvinsk, Poland, in the 1920s. But I guess there were horses and buggies and an occasional car. Apparently, he was extremely careful. And as Talmidim said, you know, Rebbe, why are you? You cross the street and then you wait for a carriage to pass and you go a little more and you cross again. And why do you wait until there's nothing on the whole street and then you cross? He said, well, I'll tell you why. There's 613 mitzvahs in the Torah. And if you make a mistake, for 612 mitzvahs, you can do tshuva. But there's one mitzvah that you can't do tshuva for. And that's the mitzvah of nishmarta me'odet nafshotechem. Be very careful with your lives. Be very, very careful with your health. On that one, there's no tshuva. So be, I want you, you know, I want you to be very machmir, be very strict in all of the things that have to do with masks and staying inside and washing hands. You should be super strict. This is the time to be super strict. Okay? Okay. Thank you. See you later, Thank guys. Thank you. Enjoy. See you next week. Bye. Bye. It's interesting, it's interesting stuff. It's an interesting tomorrow. Now, what's next? Have to make a decision. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do that. Convince yourself. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that when it does wear off, actually, this doesn't really work. And I don't know if I'm going to do it. 
Try and go out. No, don't say I'm going to do it. Give yourself a positive method. I'm going to do it. Start to stop for a minute, give it a minute, and then start again. That was dumb. We go so fast, I just forgot to start the car. Past people, I should have the yeah. They always have the mask. Yeah. I can look so I can breathe yeah. like, while you're walking. Yeah. Yes. You could just take a run with me. That's just so awful. No, 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 sweetie. So could, awful. Uh, no, I mean, I that's have wrong. To... That's dependence, and okay. I'm not going to allow it to happen. I'm not allowing it to happen. Don't you understand? No. 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 It's not done. I will do what I have to do. You will do what you have to do. I'm not going to allow this to happen. I allowed it to happen too much with the drugs. I should have stopped it a month ago. I knew it. I saw it happening clearly. I'm not, I'm not, you no, I'm not. Janice, Janice, Janice. Jan, Janice, I'm going to say something now and I want you to understand. I'm not driving you to your medical appointments. Do you understand that? How I feel with your drugs. No, no, you didn't. Our, okay, do, I have to, do I have to hit you over the head? Okay. <laughs> I'm not driving you to your medical appointments. You're a big girl. You were. No, 
you were like, you felt like this, I would help you. you. No, 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 that's not it. You missed it. You missed the point completely. No, no. Feeling bad is not a reason for dependence. It's not a way of, it's not a way of manipulating dependence. Feeling bad is watching. No, 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 no. When you come back, we'll have a real discussion about this. Oh, you know, oh, this, you know, that's all you talk about as far as I can see. I, I will give you, but I will give you lots of emotion, but I won't, I won't allow you to become dependent. The car is all the way downstairs. I don't think the alarm is on. I'm quite sure the, I know the alarm is not on. The alarm is not on. Did you hear me? Oh, I bloody well know what dependence is. I know very well what it is. And I'm looking at other people. You don't know what dependence is. You're convinced it's just this one time, and it's because that's a you don't know what dependence is. It's just this one time. It's because of that, and it's only because, and I only wish, and if you knew, and it, that's dependence.
Hello. Oh, shoot. Did you try once or twice? Turn the light. No. Shit. Go down and start to come out. Um, well, I have, I have, I have jumpers. If, if, if I get the jumpers on, we can start the car. But I don't know who to call to get the jumpers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have cables. Yeah. I'm going down there. I just forgot to go down. It's Wednesday already. Damn it. All right, so I, I'll, I'll call Gershon and I'll see what I can do. No, you have to put a little gas. Star 5341. Okay. Okay, does, does the, does the, does the, um, Wait, stop, stop, no, stop, 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 stop. There's the, there's the star five, three, four, one, and then the immobilizer goes off. Oh, it does a little leap. And then just clicks. Is, is the car in, is the car in, new, is the car in park? It should go a little bit. Mamish nothing. Okay, I'm going to come down and look at it, and I'll see if I can get here. She did jump. Yeah, I might as well come down now. Yeah, okay, okay, bye.
I forgot to start my car and the battery's dead. I'm just wondering. Oh, you have an electric. <laughs> yeah. The time goes so fast, I just forgot, you know, like I said, I got to do that every two days to start the car. So in the meantime, now it's four days, and that's, that's the end of the story. Yeah. Well, I'm also fucked in. I can look over as well, too. I'm a white, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the gray, I'm a gray, no, I'll go look at what kind of, I know Heller, Heller has a, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look, how are, you, how are you guys holding up, everything is fine, you have food, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, it's fine, you go early, it's not so bad. Yeah. I go once a week. I go for early Friday morning. I get the dollars. I get the, you know, whatever we need for Yeah. Well, my son, I know, Kyle was also on it. He's like, he's at work. He's in a, so he basically, he's in a, 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 he's he's in a, he's in a, he's yeah, yeah, he's got a TV, he's got a set of piece of paper, he drives all over the place, and they're like super strict, they're all wheelchair bound, they're like, you know, they go rolling. Um, right next to, you know, Mukhedit, the Mukhedit on Durin? Uh, it's basically right, half a block to him from there. So he goes, yeah, he goes like, they want to have parking there. So, the, the, yeah, so it's a whole building that has private parking, so yeah, no. They have private parking there, and, and uh, you know, they're super, super strict. Oh, well, that's the problem. I went on a Friday. And then, uh huh, you got it. Yes. Well, every second day. Well, I've been doing every second, every two, three days, I've been going. And I just, this week, I don't know it. What happened? Just like all of a sudden it's Wednesday. I've been going every two, three days starting and I drive once around the, you know, I drive around the parking lot once and I sit there for five minutes and rub the end.
the book as an article that we decide to focus on and they have a retraction or a correction, we'll point out that there was a retraction. Yeah, I'm curious. Sure, I'm curious. You mentioned some of those from the place. Some of the I'm curious whether you, you felt that that worked or whether there was oh, countervailing yes. questions. Hold on one I, sec. I, I let me not, show. Let sure. me show it. Uh, some of the Europe folks now who in the Trump era also are, are pushing back, which is consistent with the point you make. Let's take a look. The president of the United States of America is prepared to commit a felony to get reelected. The president has offered no evidence to support what he has said. There's ample evidence that this doesn't require too much analysis uh, to indict the president. That's incorrect. He's been saying it for a while now, but it's simply not true. The behavior of the president uh, is immoral, uh, deceptive, and repellent. Fox News knows of no evidence to support the president's claim. Go ahead. Access is a problem for journalists all over the place. Uh, and when any organization gets too close to the president of the United States, a politician has a problem. It happened with the New York Times when Judy Miller was giving, taking the word of Dick Cheney as opposed to everybody else when it came to the, the Iraqis having with nuclear weapons. Uh, it happened in the Lyndon Johnson administration all the time. He used to have uh, reporters come over and talk to them all the time. Uh, there's nothing wrong with access if it's used right. The question is whether or not you're pushing an agenda or you're informing the, you're, you're informing the electorate. Do you think and the Fox News evening or some of the evening, in your view, has become basically a direct alliance, a sort of a, a kitchen cabinet? Um, and providing basically media services for <laughs> for Donald Trump. I think I think when a president or when a politician gives a smack to a reporter for getting under their skin, that's a good thing. When they're getting bad boys and pats on the back, something's wrong. Our job All is right, to I gotta call you on that. What's going on. I gotta call you on that since you said that. I'm gonna play Donald Trump on Carl Cameron. Take a look. Carl Cameron, who's a nice guy, he said, no, they only have 1,500 people here. Start counting them up, Carl, because you got a lot of people here, Carl. Your response and whether you think he's going to continue to like you under your new project. My response is that I was right that day. He didn't have a big, huge crowd, and I'm right today. Telling the truth is more important than trying to be popular. Hmm. Uh, well put and a fitting end, and I think you know, you've done a lot of work for a long time. There are folks who might know about you only from your news organization and not from your own work, uh, but I'm not anyone. Twice as much. The papers, paper ad said Trump okay, lost bad. so much money I can't put good he was papers. able to avoid paying income taxes for eight of the ten years they exist. So, he doesn't pay income taxes. Well, that's one way to get rid of it. So, you know, wait, wait. This is also confusing because, I thought you know, he was so successful. I'm in the art of the deal, and I wanted to get into real estate. As you all know, I'm really good with money and investing. Right. Yeah, that's why Lily and I go to the well, dog I track every day. And uh, the dog. Play 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 the dog. What's so interesting is, and, and, and why this is, this actually is news from the case closed. Case closed, and this doesn't mean anything. It actually does, because really that NBC report from 1991, uh, the belief was then that Donald Trump was flying high in the 80s and then crashed when the, the economy went down in 1991. Things went, went terribly wrong. What this New York Times report shows us was that it was always a scam. He was always losing money, even in the years leading up to uh, the art of the deal. He had lost hundreds of millions of dollars. He, and while he was losing money, his father was making money. In fact, his father's only losses were investments in his son, and he had already given his son equivalent in 2019 dollars of like 215 million dollars to getting started he lost all of that money he lost all of the 415 million and more well this is the second chapter in a story that began by the same group of reporters at the new york times in october when they wrote the piece about fred trump donald trump's father who actually gave donald trump all the money that he squandered over the years this is the next chapter in a story that again does more than poke a hole. It completely conflates the entire narrative yeah. around Donald Trump, which is that he made himself into this magnate in New York City. He 
got a TV wrote books about how to become a magnate. So rich. He got a TV show that was based upon the fact that he was great at business. He could teach you how to be great at business. He was tough and he fired people. And eventually it made him so famous in part that it put him into the White House. But the thing about it, yeah, before part of the deal, he was already losing hundreds yeah. of millions of dollars and wrote a book about how you could be a good deal maker. And now we know he was losing hundreds of millions of dollars. People that were really good. Our first guest tonight, as I just mentioned, is one of the reporters who delivered the breaking news of the night in the New York Times. The breaking news tonight is that the New York Times has obtained 10 years of Donald Trump's tax information. The New York Times report tells us three big things. One, Donald Trump doesn't pay taxes. Two, Donald Trump loses massive amounts of money from business. And three, Donald Trump has always been financially dependent on his father. Those are all things that Donald Trump does not want voters to know about his financial life. All of those things clash with the image of successful businessmen that Donald Trump presents to his supporters. It is possible that these six years of tax returns that have been legally demanded from the IRS by House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Richard Neal would reveal a similar pattern for Donald Trump, possibly with financial supporters other than his father like perhaps a Russian oligarch or two. Those tax returns are being illegal withheld from Chairman Neal by Treasury Secretary Stephen Mitchell. But Chairman Neal will eventually succeed in obtaining those tax returns because he belongs entirely on his side. In the meantime, though, tonight's New York Times report is the most detailed picture yet of 10 years of Donald Trump's financial life from 1985 and it shows Donald Trump declaring losses of $1 billion over that 10-year period while paying relatively small amounts of federal income taxes for only two of the 10 years. In eight of those years, Donald Trump paid no taxes at all. One year shows a mysterious surge in interest income for Donald Trump of $15.9 billion with no accompanying evidence of any assets that much interest. Donald Trump paid no taxes that year because his business losses were higher than that of the year. In the middle of the period studied by the New York Times, Donald Trump kept finding copies about just how hard it was out there for him to get that money. I've seen the world where we saw it as a points out, Donald Trump's father, who was a much more stable businessman than his son, did well during those same years. The Times reports, while Donald Trump reported hundreds of millions of dollars in losses for 1990 and 1991, Brent Trump's returns showed a positive income of $53.9 million, with only one major loss, $58 million invested in his son's latest apartment. And leaving us off our discussion tonight is Suzanne Craig. She's the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter for the New York Times. She co authored tonight's report in the New York Times. The piece is entitled Decade in the Red Trump Tax Review Show Over One Billion Business Losses. Thanks for joining us for a photo of the first time. Love this John Howell of National Affairs Analyst and Political Radio News. So, Chris Evans, NBC, is co host and executive producer of Joe Times and Circus. And Nick and Justin Lewis is a former.
Fauci. He's been a rare source of clarity for the Trump administration's response. Dr. Fauci, as a truth teller with science, knowledge, evidence, data, and that's what we have to have if we're going to have a cure. Dr. Anthony Fauci has emerged as one doctor that just about everyone in America knows. He trusted scientific experts during this pandemic. Also, a glaring contrast to a president has fomented misinformation at this period of time. Look at the latest numbers that show 36% of Americans trust what the president said, while almost double, a full 60% prefer to trust Fauci. Now, this doctor is not the only medical expert on the task force, nor the only veteran and public servant in the picture. So it's not exactly just automatic that any doctor would stand so tall above the administration that he served in, but Fauci has been at this a long time, appointed in 1984 to run the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, the same post he holds now, and he was accustomed to leadership role long before that. Did you know he was captain right here of his high school basketball team? And he was the academic leader of his peers when he finished first in his class right there at Cornell Medical School. Fauci also stepped into the lead professionally when working at the NIH in the early 80s, taking on what was then a strange new disease called AIDS. I'm working directly on, on AIDS from a clinical research and science standpoint. What I'd like to do this evening is to review for you some of the most recent advances in AIDS, as well as provide for you a background for understanding how we got to where we are today in our understanding of AIDS. That's old school Fauci right there. His empirical, no nonsense approach built trust across party lines. He was an advisor to presidents in both parties. He worked to collaboratively protect decades. And right now, at a time when many are asking, why weren't we more prepared? Why didn't we save lives and money investing in detection and testing earlier instead of getting hit like this and watching so many? Okay. Yeah, I don't listen. I'm gonna try Heller right now. I don't I don't yeah, I don't think I don't want to start up with someone I don't know. Okay, okay, bye. Bye. Okay, bye. Yeah, who is the guy? Okay, all right, I'll try Heller. I'll try Heller. Okay, bye. Thank you.
Hello, Baruch Hashem. Lo, lo, lo. At the bar, no, but I'm at the low. Can, can, seder. As a tayachol, a tayachol im chok at Hashem, should it be seder? Okay. So, bye.